All right, let's get started. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we're very happy to have uh, Ryan tell us about uh, optimizing non commutative polynomials and hopefully some, a little bit about black holes. So that was all your black holes, sorry. <laughs> uh, great, thanks. So uh, let's talk about this problem. Uh, maximize. Pravesh talked about even in the first lecture here, sum over like J1 less than J2, less than J3, less than J4. They're between one and N. Uh, some real coefficient, A, S, let me just say S stands for J1 through J4, times like some indeterminates, chi J1, chi J2, chi J3, chi J4. Uh, okay, and like in Pravesh's talk, you know, we'll say subject to uh, chi j squared equals one for all j. Okay, so you would think of this as like optimizing a homogeneous degree four polynomial over the Boolean cube, which is uh, something I know like a lot of you have thought about before. Uh, now, actually, when you do this, when you, you know, try to solve it or like throw your sum of squares algorithm at it or whatnot, you actually have like another uh, relation in mind besides just this one, xj squared equals one. You're actually always thinking to yourself this too, chi j chi k equals chi k chi j, for all j not equal to k. Okay, because, well, you know, multiplication of two numbers commutes, so that's good. Uh, okay, so uh, in some sense, this what this talk is gonna be about is like, what if instead of all the um, indeterminates commuting, like what if they were to anti-commute? Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's my last audio joke. Um, of course, uh, you might say, like, what does it even mean? Like, what are we doing here? Like, numbers commute. So, what what are these pi j supposed to stand for? Well, actually, they should stand for the things that they, uh, you know. They, um, you might normally think of it as a representation, they should stand for matrices, okay? And matrices have the potential to commute. So what we're really looking for here is like a, a representation. This is like over, you know, representations like pi, or you can just think of it as like assignments that map all the chi j's to matrices in some dimension, okay? And any dimension D of your choice. Uh, and, you know, sorry to introduce complex numbers, but I guess in, you know, representations, it's like actually more pleasant to allow complex matrices. So we're going to do that. Uh, but just to like make it a little bit more relaxing, let's also add in one more um, constraint now that these matrices are supposed to be self-adjoint or Hermitian. So I'll also say that chi j star equals chi j for all j. Right, so good. There's still a question like, wait, what's going on? What are we trying to actually optimize here? So let's call this H, this polynomial H. And I'm going to kind of blur the distinction between like the formal polynomial and like the actual matrix you get under a substitution. So this thing is a matrix. What are we trying to optimize? We're trying to optimize it's like maximum eigenvalue. Okay, so really the maximization is maximize the eigenvalue of this. Okay, or if you're like a physics person, we're looking for the ground state energy of minus H. I mean, sorry to the physics people, but it's too stressful for me to have the optimum being negative. So we're gonna try to maximize. Uh, great, so um, one more thing. Uh, now that these uh, matrices could potentially be complex or even before that, you might think, oh, they could have like complex eigenvalues. Maybe that's a little stressful, but we're only ever going to consider um, polynomials which are themselves self-adjoint and therefore have real eigenvalues. And therefore, you know, this maximization is just maximizing over real eigenvalues. So just to um, clarify some things, these are going to be in this talk real numbers. And I claim this H will actually always be self-adjoint under any substitution. So let's just check that um, for fun. So H star going to be the sum over all these uh, ordered sets of j's of, you know, a s chi j one through chi j four star, which is, okay, the a's are real, so that's fine. And the chi j's are self-adjoint, so this only has the effect of reversing them. 
pi j1. Actually, let me write it all the way out. Pi j3, pi j2. This is sort of just for practice, pi j1. So now we can use the anti-commutation property as much as we like, and let's do that to like reorder them. So I'll draw some funny arrows and hopefully you'll see what I mean. Like we're gonna use anti-commutation to bring this chi j4 here, that gives a minus sign, and then here, and then here, that's three minus signs, and we push the chi j4 to the end. And then we'll get another one here and another one here, that's two more, and now chi j3 got pushed to the end, and we'll do like one more to push chi j2 into this right place. And we picked up like six minus signs, which is nothing. Okay, and so we end up with this, which is uh, H. Does this depend on having an even degree polynomial or something like this? Yes, it did depend on having an even degree polynomial. Uh, so in, you know, in the work, we consider other degree polynomials, but we're gonna stick to degree four in this, in this talk. Great. Okay, so you may have several questions at this point, and if you ever have any questions, feel free to just ask them. Um, two things you could ask. Uh, first of all, why would you consider this is a valid question, and I'll try to say some things about that. And another thing that uh, you could ask, which I'll address first is, well, are you maximizing over an empty set? Do there even exist like matrices that all pairwise commute like this? And uh, the answer is yes. And in some sense, there's kind of like a unique choice. I'll sort of say what I mean by that. So here's a fact. Um, there exists like a representation or assignment, whatever you want to call it, um, pi that maps these chi j's into uh, d dimensional matrices, where d is two to the n over two, okay? In fact, you can't do it in less dimension. Okay, so such matrices and mutually anti-commuting matrices that square to the identity do exist, but um, only in dimension that's at least exponential. I can also assume n is even everywhere, okay? And uh, in some sense, which I don't wanna like bother like spending time uh, trying to make precise, they're kind of like unique irreducible such representation. So up to conjugating this specific assignment pi by unitaries, which doesn't change any of the relations or the maximum eigenvalue, and up to like taking several such representations and then stacking them block diagonally, which also doesn't improve your ability to optimize this, there's actually sort of just like one representation. And uh, I'll tell it to you uh, briefly. Um, it maps like uh, chi j to a matrix called gamma j. The physicists call these like Majorana operators or Majorana gamma matrices. And I'll, I can tell you what it is. Like, so gamma one is like the Pauli X operator uh, times I oh, times I times et cetera. As I'm writing this, let me stress that it's 100% not important to know this specific thing. We're actually only going to use these relations to do our own all our analysis. But I thought I'd tell it to you anyway. So like a bunch of i's. This is like n over two factors. Um, gamma three is like z x i's. Gamma four is like z y i's. This is only if you care. And the next one's like z z x z z y. Okay. And if you like, while I'm talking, if you know these matrices, you can verify to yourself that they all pairwise anti-commute. So these are always the two by two matrices? X yeah, X, Y, and Z are these certain two by two poly matrices. This is like, um, yeah, zero, one, one, zero is X. And, but the only thing you need to know about those is these are three little two by two matrices that pairwise, um, well, that like X times Y is Z and so forth, like the quaternions. Yeah, I think if you can, yeah, I think you can represent them in n dimensions with uh, completely real matrices. And uh, we're not going to get stressed too much about that either. So you can you can think about that too. Um, okay, so actually, because of this sort of uniqueness, like without loss of generality, you can basically assume it's this assignment. 
actually, I guess that's how like physicists think about it. They don't think about it sort of in the way I described where like you're searching over all possible assignments to try to optimize this. They literally just think of this one fixed assignment that I have in mind. But still the problem is not trivial because it's like an exponential sized, um, these are exponential sized matrices. And so this is like also a, an exponential sized matrix that's sort of implicitly told to you. Like you're told it's like this polynomial, these are numbers that are given to you in the input. You know it's these matrices. So you're trying to find this largest eigenvalue of this implicitly represented um, huge matrix. Actually, there is one nice thing to know about these um, matrices, which is that they're all sparse. They're all exactly as sparse as uh, the identity matrix. So the number of non-zeros is um, D, okay? And so you're actually adding up, you know, N to the fourth such products of sparse matrices. So the overall matrix is sparse. It has like poly log and dimension number of entries. So it's this implicitly represented, exponentially large, sparse matrix. You're trying to understand its largest eigenvalue. But you, but you, you don't use, there's still multiple, multiple assignments, right? Because you could just, you could permute, because the ASs are different for different sets, right? So I could like pick which Ji goes to which gamma. Uh, yeah. So I guess the point is that like, um, this is an assignment. A different assignment would like involve, as you say, shuffling these around, but it would have the same largest eigenvalue. Why is that, given that the ASs are different for different? Yeah, I guess it's not obvious, but it's... Uh, no matter what ASs I give you, a different assignment will have the... Yeah, I think you can a shuffle it. I believe this is right. I might be wrong, but like I think if you like shuffled these, then there would be a, like a one unitary, which I think would be equivalent to like conjugating all of these by a fixed unitary would achieve that shuffling. And therefore, they would be equivalent to conjugating H by a fixed unitary. Even that's oh, because you because like the EUs would come here and they would cancel on the yeah, insides. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, good question. Yeah. So here is the, the way that these constraints are written. So each of if, if we use the, this explicit representation, then each of those matrices has to occur exactly once among the five J's, right? It has to be a permutation of that collection of yeah. So any polynomial you write down, first of all, uh by using the anti-commutation relations as much as possible, you can like move the indeterminates around in the ordering in each monomial at the expense of changing the signs. And then if ever two adjacent ones collide, like you can use the fact that the square is one to erase it. So you can take any poly polynomial, make it multilinear, and even make it so that in the monomials, it's always in lexicographic order up to changing the signs. So in some sense, this is like the most general degree four polynomial you can write down since you have these relations. Okay, but like so from the anti-commuting relations, it seems like like I can't set you know chi one and chi two both to equal gamma one, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, yeah, it's not so easy to find matrices that sat that all mutually anti-commute. Any more questions? Yep. I guess I how easy how easy is it to show that you can't you can't find uh experiment makes you a much smaller dimension? Um I think it's elementary, but not like super easy. Like I don't think you would prove it to yourself in like 10 minutes. But you could read like a short like eight, six page explanation that's totally elementary. Okay, so I mean Presumably yeah. showing this is going to boil down to showing that like the algebra of C adjoined all of these operators modulo their um, relations is equivalent to some matrix algebra in D dimensions. Exactly right. These are actually this, uh, the matrix algebra with this. Well, the matrix algebra with C D times D is isomorphic to this matrix algebra of non-commutative polynomials with these relations. Um, that's like, a, like an elementary fact, and I guess representation theory of algebra is what I mean. I have to look it up. Uh, okay, so that's uh, one question. The other question was like, why? Why would you care to do this? I mean, it seemed fun, but uh, yeah, why? So, uh, one reason is um, it turns out that this is actually the arguably like the most fundamental problem in quantum chemistry. It's like literally this. So like arguably the like most basic problem 
in quantum chemistry. And it's sometimes called um, electronic structure or electron structure. I don't know about actual science. So I was going to say, please don't ask me any questions, but you can ask me these questions, but I might just say, I don't know. Um, yeah? Can you briefly explain why having a thing here is easy? Oh, great. OK, good question. So yeah, let me say some words like that, and then I'll say some words about that, too. So uh, what is what is this? Like, maybe you imagine you have a molecule, and it has some electrons. And there's some interactions between the um, uh, electrons. And like, you have like maybe all possible pairwise interactions are possible. And uh, each one has like a coupling, which is like some sort of strength. And that gives you a Hamiltonian. And you're interested in the ground state of that Hamiltonian, because that'll tell you how the electrons will be structured. That's the extent of what I know about that. Now, you might say like, Hmm, there's something kind of funny here because, okay, you have like all pairwise interactions. You might guess that that uh, would lead to a degree two polynomial. <laughs> Wouldn't that make sense? Apparently not. I mean, I guess not. I guess the reason is like for like fermions, like electrons, you know, if you have a fermion, it always has like a creation operator and an annihilation operator. And so like, if you have two fermions interacting, there's like four matrices, like the creation and annihilation operator for one, and the creation and annihilation operator for the other. So that's why this is degree four. And anybody that knows more about that, feel free to say. Yeah, do you have a question, Jerry? Sorry, like, uh, how, is, how are degree two terms allowed if it's supposed to be something? Good. So you can put in degree two terms if you want. If you do, then it's most pleasant to like put in i times like a real coefficient times chi j chi k because this will be self adjoint like if you star this without the i then you'll get chi k chi j and that's the negative of that so it's you could be like okay fine my spectrum is purely imaginary in that case but it's nicer to just stick in an i on the degree two terms to keep it self adjoint uh i'll say something else about your question maybe it's not answering your question but i shall say it um yeah so uh in fact, because of what I said, that this like sort of models like pairwise interactions with you know fermions, it turns out that like as an algorithmic problem, this problem right here with degree four has the flavor of being like more difficult than the degree two commutative case, which is kind of like you know Max Cut, Sherrington, Kirkpatrick, etc., but less difficult than like the degree four commuting case which we kind of know is like very hard and hard to approximate and so forth. And maybe even closer to the degree two case. So it's like somewhere with a weird sweet spot where this might be like actually kind of tractable and have some interesting algorithms and things. Um, and to further say some more things about your question, Chris, uh, the homogeneous degree two version of this problem is easy. It's not obvious, but there's like a classical algorithm that's efficient that um, Kind of like diagonalizes the degree two thing and just tells you the exact optimum. It's pretty fast. So you diagonalize A and then you put it. It's pretty fast. Okay. So you diagonalize A and then you put the low lying states, you put the vectors. Um, yeah, like up to like a unitary transformation, you can like make all the monomials have disjoint indices in the degree two case, and then it kind of acts like the commutative case. Yeah. Um, okay, so sort of in the, for worst case instances, it's kind of like quantum chemists, like really like this problem. Um, there's also the average case instances, the Gaussians, okay? So this is called the SYK model. So it's like you take the SK model and you put a Y in the middle. <laughs> it's like Sachdev, Ye, and Kitaev. This is the random case. Uh, so the A, S's are independent Gaussians. And let's agree to make their variance one over N choose four, or to put a square root one over N choose four here, just so that for normalization, um, so that I always like to have this sum over S, A, S squared equals one. Well, in expectation in this case. 
So if you're a physicist that loves the SYK model, they use a different normalization than this, and I'm probably annoying you, but I think for this crowd and for me, I like it. Um, so this average case version of the problem was like studied in the 1970s by nuclear physicists, and then in like the 80s by condensed matter physicists. But somehow physics people got really excited, like string theorists got really excited in the maybe 90s when Kitaev, you know, the quantum computation person, among other things, like proposed this as like a tractable model for black holes. Um, so somehow, in a way that I really don't understand, this is like an excellent model for um, the zero dimensional boundary of one dimensional black holes. And like there's holography and maximally chaotic stuff and other terms that I don't really understand. But it's kind of exciting that like whenever you type like SYK model into like Google, you get all these papers about like black holes and holography and string theory, and it's really exciting. Um, so they really love this model, but I also love it too, because yeah, it's a random degree four polynomial. Like that's no problem. It's cool. It's great. Um, so it's hard for me to explain much more about why they're super interested in it. But let me tell you one thing that's empirically true about this SYK model, the random model, which is our main interest in this work, although we also say some things about the worst case instances, um, that I think is connected to why they're very excited about this model. So it's a model of a random, you know, you're looking at the eigenvalues of a random kind of sparse matrix. And, but it's got an eigenvalue distribution that's not the kind they expected at first, maybe. So um, empirically, and according to like physics heuristics, so seemingly, um, uh, the eigenvalue distribution of H, by which I mean the two to the n over two dimensional matrix you get by these are random, and then these are that fixed assignment, uh, looks like a Gaussian, actually. Um, or perhaps a truncated Gaussian, they're not exactly sure. Um, and so this is like, you know, supposed to be like a histogram of the eigenvalues of H. So it's actually some discretized thing. And, um, you know, there are two to the n over two eigenvalues, because that's the dimension. So you might think that this like maximum is kind of like, you know, the maximum value if you drew two to the n over two Gaussians which would be like square root of log of two to the n over two. So it'd be like theta of like proportional to root n. And this, uh, oops, this is like the physics belief or knowledge about what is the answer with high probability. It's proportional to root n. Um, and they even have some heuristics, which I'll talk a tiny bit about if I get a chance that says it's even like n over, I think um, two root, sorry, root n over two root two. Okay, so they feel like they know the constant. Um, but one thing that I guess is surprising to them, which makes them, gives them some joy, is it's kind of um, different that um, there are exponentially few states that are like achieving close to the maximum. And this is somehow like different from like, a sort of typical thing that happens when you have some kind of random matrix model and maybe you expect like a circular semicircular law where there's some like really hard boundary here and like a constant fraction of the states are like pretty high. Like, no, it seems that like it's it's different. Like there are only exponentially few states that are close to optimum. So uh, that's that. Any, yep. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know, but uh, shortly I will tell you another elementary argument that will show that the answer is big O of root n. Um, yeah, so it's a classical situation where like you read the physics papers, they're like really into like exactly nailing the asymptotic spacing right around here and they like looking at the expansions of the distributions, whereas like the math papers are like, let's try to prove it's big O over <laughs> Um Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, so let me tell you some of the results uh, in our paper. Maybe the two main results in our paper. Um, and in some sense, they're both of like the form um, mathematically proving that it's theta of root N. 
although there's algorithmic aspects to both our results. Okay, so theorem one. Uh, with high probability, this is all for SYK model, with high probability, um, degree six SOS certifies that uh, opt of H is at most some constant C1 times root N. Okay, and in our proof, C1 is some number one plus root six square root of, which is like 1.86 or something. Okay, so there's an efficient algorithm that certifies with high probability, with high probability of redundancy and certifies the uh, truth is big O of root N. And the constant is not uh, too bad even. This is like um, non-commutative SOS, but it's it's really the same as if you know SOS that you love, like you, there are no surprises in what's going on with this SOS uh, formulation of the problem. So in fact, what this means, I mean, literally what this means is uh, the algorithm like shows that C1 root N minus H is representable like in the algebra as a sum of squares uh, like G, J, star g j okay and that is a certificate if you can find uh, an identity like this in the algebra because even under any substitution the right hand side will be psd and therefore that certifies that h has all its eigenvalues at most of this uh okay and also interestingly as an aside um we can also show that degree four sos doesn't work so remark, you can show that degree four SOS, sort of the minimum, uh, thinks that opt could be uh, at least root uh, N. Um, great. Uh, in the meantime, let me tell you another uh, fact from the literature. This is like the mathematician, mathematician's literature. It's like um, Ren Jiefeng, Gong Tian, and Gong Chi Liu. They showed not too long ago this fact. So previously, it was shown by kind of a simple argument, although it's a very clever argument. With high probability, uh, the optimum is at most uh, C2 times root n, where C2 is a smaller constant. It's um, root ln 2, okay, which is, I don't know, 0.83. And this argument of theirs is similar in flavor, if you know, to like the, the Chernoff bound that shows if you choose like a random CSP or whatever, with high probability, the optimum will be small. So in particular, it has that like un sos flavor, like you prove that in, it, in advance of choosing a random instance, with high probability, it's gonna have a really small optimum or this small optimum. But like once you're faced with the actual instance and you're like, please certify to me that this instance has a small optimum, this proof doesn't help you do it. But we showed that you, you can do it efficiently. Can I have a sense that gap is real or? Uh, uh, it's too early to tell. There are a lot of open problems. Uh, yeah, I mean, this was the best thing we could get. And it seemed like maybe if you tinker with it, you could improve this, but yeah, don't know. Uh, okay. And as I said, the, the physics heuristic is that the optimum is like this even smaller constant. I don't know, it's like 0. 0.3 something, five root n. Yeah. Here there seems to be a gap between degree four and degree six, but from the problems that we all know and love, the gap is between two and four. That's, yeah, that's funny. Is there, I don't know. Don't know. The best thing I can say is that, like, in some weird mystical sense, it's like most resembles degree two in the commutative case. And then maybe you can imagine there are some instances where, like, degree two SOS doesn't know the answer, but if you allow something like triangle inequality, you can do it. So that's the spirit in which I imagine something like this is plausible. Yep. So is the constant in front of the square root of right? that is strictly smaller than degree two? Random gauche, right? That correct. Would, so, that would be correct. 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 So, it's not, uh, it's like a slightly more sophisticated. I, I was just being a little glib here. There is an underlying heuristic that says uh, this should look like a Gaussian, but for some reasons, it's like a different constant here than you would get if it was literally just a Gaussian. 
very sharp, uh, Andrea. He's good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so theorem two. <laughs> Theorem two that we prove is um, the lower bound. Theorem two with high probability, um, the optimum is at least, uh, let's just say omega root n. We don't have an explicit constant here. And in fact, well, I'll fill in this in fact in a moment, um, but okay, this is the lower bound. Um, one thing I can say is, uh, to our knowledge, there was not previously any explicit lower bound proven, even though the physicists, you know, like know what it is. Um, it wasn't proven. Sorry. Um, yeah, actually, in this work of uh, this is uh, Feng Tian and um, what was it? Wei. Uh, it's implicit in this work. You can get from this work that uh, with high probability, the optimum is um, little omega of one. It goes to infinity with n. You can get that out of their work with no trouble. But um, we show what I guess is the right lower bound. And um, the in fact is like related to algorithmic certification of this lower bound. So you're used to the fact uh, the, the the sense in these these problems like this. That like, okay, in the upper bound, you need to talk about like certification and so forth. But for the lower bound, like you normally just like, I exhibit the, the assignment of plus and minus one to so these X's and that's obviously a certificate. But in this version, it's actually not clear how to certify lower bounds efficiently either. Like what you gonna do? Like, you know, even what like um, uh, gamma, like matrices you're supposed to plug in here, but they're at an exponential dimension. So how do you certify that this uh, implicitly described exponentially large matrix has a large eigenvalue? You could try to say what the large eigenvector is, but that's an exponential size object. So it's kind of unclear. Um, although we, I should mention that in the degree two case, you sort of face, face the same difficulties, but you can do it. I mean, you can implicitly describe the optimal eigenvector and like in polynomial time and it constitutes a certificate that the thing is large. Um, so the in fact is as follows. It's like a quantum certification algorithm for this. So let me say what I mean. Uh, there exists an efficient you know, poly time quantum algorithm W that outputs a quantum state, basically kind of like the, the large eigenvector that's certifying this. So it's outputting like a log D, which is like N over two qubit state um, row. It's like the output, you give it H, you give it the coefficients of H, it outputs this quantum state row is like N over two qubits, such that, um, when H is chosen from SYK or H chosen from SYK, meaning all the coefficients are Gaussians um, at random with high probability um, trace row H is at least omega root N. Okay, so like this is like a, an eigenvector, which is like asserting that uh, there's an eigenvalue of H that's at least root N. Is that a question or? Yeah. What? In what sense is it outputting the state? Like, how did it? Good. So let me talk about that. The question was in what sense is like outputting the state? So um, this is a quantum computer, like, and therefore it can output like N over two qubits whose state is this row. But you still have some questions because how is this like a certificate? Like, how do you check this fact? Um, the thing is, uh, if you have a quantum computer, this task is checking this is doable efficiently, albeit randomly. So this is actually like kind of a very subtle point about what it means to certify something. So like, allow me to ask you to think about this like subtle point. Um, so, 
Uh, here's a remark. Given any H and any quantum state, quantum state rho, um, there exists like a very simple, I mean, if you know quantum, it's, it's, it's easy, simple algorithm, quantum algorithm for empirically estimating trace rho H. Up to like small error. So in particular, like uh, for any accuracy, like plus or minus one over poly n, which is more than enough accuracy, since you're just trying to certify this, and like confidence one minus delta. So it's kind of still like a randomized algorithm. Uh, you get confidence uh, one minus delta, and this is in time poly n, quantum time, poly n and log one over delta. And this holds for any row in any age. It's just a simple like estimation, empirical estimation algorithm to empirically estimate this fact. So what I'm trying to say is if you have a quantum computer, this is like a good certification algorithm that you should be happy about because it doesn't depend on the input. There's like this tunable confidence parameter that you can make whatever you want, no matter what the input is. You can set it to be two to the minus 500 and spend an extra factor of 500 and like, really become genuinely certain, okay, up to probably two to the minus 500, that this row uh, is uh, good. It's like a good state that certifies that it's root n. Yeah. Confidence is over randomness of the algorithm? The confidence is only over like the randomness of the algorithm. So it works for any h, any quantum state, not to do with that. So you're like, you're not cheating by like saying like, oh, if I get a good draw from SYK, I can certify it. Literally for any output, you can basically test this with a quantum computer with like zero error. Uh, yes. Good. Uh, let me come back to that in a moment uh, to say that um, we don't know any classical algorithm with the same property. We, meaning like me and Matt, uh, don't know any classical uh, efficient certification algorithm for, you know, opt of H to at least omega root N, you know, with high probability over H drawn from SYK. Whereas I, you know, say to you that we do know an efficient quantum algorithm for this task, certifying that a random SYK instance has um, value at least root n. And so arguably we have here an example of a natural problem where there's an efficient quantum algorithm and we don't know a, an efficient classical algorithm. Just kind of cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, to your question, Siddhant, um, yeah, it's hard to say what a classical algorithm could look like. One. One thing that um, could be is a classical algorithm can output a classical description of a quantum state. And not just that should work, but this classical description should have the property that given the description and given any polynomial H, you can efficiently classically compute or estimate uh, trace row H. And for example, the degree two case has this property. There's a certain class of states that have a terrible name. They're called Gaussian states. They're exactly the set of states which are optimizers for degree two polynomials. And you can like write them down on a piece of paper what the state is, even though it's an exponential size object. And given such a state and a polynomial, you can evaluate what is like trace of that state times that polynomial. So this is like what a classical, um, certification algorithm might look like. It's kind of funny too, because then our algorithm that like does this, like given H, we literally write down on a piece of paper, like this state row, which you know is defined in terms of H uh, should work. And then we, then we prove it. Um, but uh, the only like algorithm that will like certify that for this 
you know, that it's not an atypical age, that it's a typical age where it works, uh, that we know is a class of, is a quantum algorithm. Yeah. Grounding SOS. Uh, yeah, it's possible. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I kind of feel like this is like a fertile area where we just got started. Like there's many, many open questions you can think of. And like, these are just the first few things we were able to prove. Um, yeah. And in fact, on this, uh, subject, yeah, this is pretty good. Um, if you're really picky and like, especially if you're comparing to the kind of classical analog, like the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And you might remember like uh, Andrea's result that sort of says with high probability, there's an efficient algorithm that finds the optimizer even up to the correct constant. You could try that here, but this also maybe is ambitious and you might think it's maybe not possible. So perhaps it's not possible. And then this would be like a natural perhaps family of Hamiltonians for like a fermionic version of Matt's NLTS conjecture, which I also sort of only sort of know what it is. But like, um, I guess it's like possible that, and I think physicists kind of believe this too, it's possible that like the, the optimizing states are like really hard to describe, like they have no efficient description at all with high probability. I guess that's kind of what the NLTS type conjectures say. Um, but if you're able to use a constant, then you have a good description. So this right. is really about like the true optimizer. Basically. Exactly. If you're willing to lose a constant, then there is like a pretty okay to describe state uh, that uh, gets that constant time to redone. Um, yeah, I could almost even stop here. Um, let me just say like there's um, a lot of open problems. Uh, there's many, many open problems you could think about. Um, uh, like the sparse case, for example, of these random polynomials. Um, one uh, variant on this, which turned out to be fruitful for us, and we had a lot of um, results about it, including like our proof of this relied on the variant that I'm about to say. Uh, I'll just say it in words. So, you know, the, the problem I told you about today is optimizing a degree for polynomial or any polynomial subject to the constraint that all the variables anti-commute. And on the other hand, if you like take say that all the variables commute, then it's exactly optimizing a polynomial over the Boolean cube, which you guys know a lot about. Um, uh, a generalization of both of these is like, in addition to the polynomial H, I give you a graph and like, uh, the variables are associated with the vertices and two variables anti-commute if there's an edge and commute if there's no edge. So for every pair of variables, they either commute or anti-commute and which way it is is specified to you as part of the input. Um, and that might seem like you're just like generalizing for generalization's sake and it's maybe not um, motivated, but um, it is motivated because I can say a little bit of words about the physics heuristic here. The physics heuristic, like you're given this degree four polynomial over variables that pairwise anti-commutes and you want to know the maximum eigenvalue or even the eigenvalue distribution. So you're like, okay, I'll do the trace method. That's what I always do. I'll try to estimate the expected value of trace of the polynomial to K for all the values of K. And if I can do that, then I'll know the eigenvalue distribution. But then you start to do it and you try to expand things out and compute and you're like, this is really annoying. Like it's too, it's too hard. Um, what should we do? Um, because you're multiplying these polynomials, everything anti-commutes. So you make the following simplifying assumption. Like when you're raising these polynomials to some powers, like the time comes when you like multiply two monomials together. And then you, these monomials either commute with each other or they don't commute with each other, two monomials. Um, but whether they do or don't depends on like the intersection size between the two sets. So you just say like, whether the, rather than like actually deciding if these two monomials compute or not, I'll just say that they compute, commute with probability P and they don't commute with probably one minus P using like some fresh coins. And I'll take P to be the right P such that like, it's the actual probability that two randomly chosen monomials of degree four commutes. But then you just cheat and assume that like whether two monomials commute or not is dependent, determined by like 
um, like a random coin flip. And then you can do the calculations. It's still hard, but you can do them, and then you get this picture. And um, it therefore motivates, I think, studying like this more generalized situation where you have indeterminates that either anti-commute or commute, and that's determined in advance by some graph. And like um, in the physics heuristic, that graph is like an Erdős rainy random graph. And if you were to not cheat and actually pay attention to what the deal is, that graph would be like some Knesser-like graph where the vertices are um, sets of size four and you put an edge if the intersection size is even. And one thing that we prove is that for any linear polynomial over indeterminates that commute or anti-commute according to a graph G, the optimum over all linear polynomials where the sum of squares of coefficients is one is bounded by the Lovas theta function of the graph. And that's pretty cool. And that goes into this proof. And um, it motivates like a combinatorial problem of determining the Lovas theta function of this Knesser light graph, which we also do in the paper. So that's fun. And there's some open questions about that too. Uh, I'm going to stop now, uh, but I can take your questions. Yeah. Does this sparse random case also have a physics chemistry interpretation? Uh, I think so. Like I watched a YouTube talk by a physicist that was like, let me tell you about the sparse SYK model. And they studied a lot of stuff and like they cared a lot about the sparsity and they found some maybe unsurprising phase transition and what things look like when the sparsity dips below like one times N. Uh, they say it kind of looks like SYK as long as the, the sparsity is bigger than one times N, the number of monoials, and it doesn't if it's smaller. Um, Physics motivation, I don't know. There's probably one, but I don't know what it is. Uh, Chris? So you wrote down those Majorana operators before, and I guess generically, if you multiply four of them together, you have like a segment of Zs over here, a segment of Zs over here, identities in between, and then maybe Xs and Ys at the ends of these segments. You might have some I's at the beginning, because like they all start with a bunch of Z's. So if you multiply four of them, you'll get four copies of Z and you'll get a bunch of I's. But... Right, so it's like I's, Z's, I's, Z's, I's. Okay. I was just wondering if that kind of structure was used in your theorem too. I mean, I like, are you actually delving a bit into the combinatorics of how, the, how what these products look like? No. In fact, uh, a good rule of thumb that it turned out to be was to like never try to remember what the matrices are and sort of only work in the like the algebra where you just know these relations that the variables anti commute. In fact, the algorithm is like a bit strange. It like, well, it introduces some extra indeterminates and like, I, I guess the physicists call it like a variational argument. You'd like, you pretend the Hamiltonian is something else that's kind of like a degree two thing. And you're like, I can write down the exact optimizer for the degree two thing. And now imagine like some like unitary rotation that takes the degree two thing, idealized thing to the real thing. And I'll try to argue that if I do that unitary rotation to my optimal solution for the degree two thing, it's still pretty good for the actual thing. And yeah, weirdly, you have to like bound some error terms, which are degree six polynomials. And you use this, uh, this theorem for it. And therefore, since we don't know how to SOS it, we don't like know how to get like an SOS lower bound somehow. We just know how to prove it. We need, so. we need the constant from this term somehow. You need the technique from this thing that sort of says if you have, uh, this thing basically says like if you have, uh, um, it kind of says if you have like a random polynomial, uh, then with high probability, the optimum is what you would get if you just pretend you substitute all the indeterminates with one and just looked at the, the number that you would get. But there's some caveats. But let me just say it's like a technique you can use to try to um, prove statements like with high probability, a polynomial drawn from some random instance has low optimum. Uh, and some random polynomials arise in this proof for the error terms. So we need this theorem. 
But this algorithm has, or this theorem has the property that like, it shows with high probability the optimum is small, but like once you actually pick a polynomial from this distribution, it's not clear how to certify that it's just small. Okay. So, yeah. uh, you said that this problem is somehow in between degree two and degree four. So in the worst case, can we expect a constant factor approximation? Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to prove it, but you could, yeah. In that case, you would solve the certification problem too. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, we proved some other things like, for example, for a worst case H, uh, the optimum can be as large as, and subject to the condition that the sum of the squares of the A's is one. For worst case H, the optimum can be as large as N. And we prove a result that's like very analogous to Charakar worth, if you know what that is from Xcut, that if I give you an H where the optimum is epsilon N, then you can find a solution, even explicitly, and certify it of value epsilon over log of one of epsilon times 10. So if it's like kind of like a, an H that has like an unusually large optimum, you can find like a very pretty good solution. Um, but the random ones don't have an unusually large optimum. I can also add that like, there, there's something even formal here, like with degree four, anti-commuting polynomials, you can simulate degree two commuting polynomials. So it's like formally like sort of strictly harder than like optimizing a degree two polynomial over the Boolean cube. Actually that your character word connection says that you might have to lose log factors, a constant may not be enough. Correct. I'm very interested to know if there's like a, like a, a, a the high end trade off, like you have in max cut, like if you have a degree four polynomial whose optimum is like one minus epsilon times the, absolute upper bound, you know, is there an efficient algorithm that gets you one minus epsilon prime times the absolute maximum where epsilon prime goes to zero with epsilon? Would that be interesting for physics class chemistry? Yeah, I don't know if the, the it seems, I don't have like theorems here, but it seems that um, the polynomials which are close to the maximum look like squares of degree two things. Or maybe like the sum of a small number of squares of degree two things. Um, and maybe that's why you can hope to do something with them. We don't have any theorems to that effect. I'm not sure if those are interesting in chemistry or not, but maybe. And is the simulation of two commuting variables you just referred to because products of pairs of these commute with each other, that like pairs of fermions or bosons? Yeah, like if you have like, you know, these anti-commuting indeterminates, pi one through pi n, you're just like, let, okay, I'll use a, a, a Latin letter, like let y ones be i, the square root of one times chi one, chi two, y two be i times chi three, chi four, let y three be i times chi five, chi six. And then the y's, you can just easily check, the y's have the property that they're self-adjoint, and they square to the identity and they commute. And therefore, you're like in the same algebra as the algebra of like plus or minus ones, and you can do some elementary things to check that, like, it's like a perfect simulation. Okay, but, but optimizing a polynomial over the cube, like, the, the, here there, there's this whole point the assignment, there's only one assignment. That's not happening in the Boolean cube. Well, actually, it is. There is like only one assignment you have to worry about for the Boolean cube. It's the assignment where to like, you're trying to give matrices. To chi one, chi two, up to chi n. These are going to be two to the n-dimensional matrices, and they're going to be diagonal matrices, and they're going to have all pluses and minuses on the diagonals, such that um, uh, for every you know position, like you have all two to the n binary strings here. So you basically take all two to the n binary strings, which is like an assignment of like a one-dimensional matrix to each. Uh, chi i, but then you stack them like block diagonally into like some giant two to the n dimensional matrices. And indeed, like when you plug these in to your polynomial, you'll get two to the n eigenvalues, and those eigenvalues will be like all the two to the n assignment values. All the evaluations. Yeah, so you're doing all the evaluations at once. The best assignment is present as an eigenvector in some sense. Exactly. So it's actually the same. Yeah, it's literally the same problem. This is also the same as like saying, another way to say that is that like all these. These assignments look like a bunch of I's and then a Z and then a bunch of I's 
or you have like the Z in like one of n different positions. Yep. Oh, such a great question. Thank you, Stefan. Oh man, the question was as the degree increases. So we were looking at degree four uh, SYK. You can look at degree Q, they call it Q, uh, SYK, which is just like random degree uh, Q polynomial, random meaning like Gaussian coefficients, and you always normalize it so the expected sum of squares is one. And if you do the physics heuristic, you can repeat it, but like the bigger Q is, like the more likely two random indeterminates like overlap. And so it's kind of like these monomials um, commute with like lower probability. And it goes like, uh, it depends first of all on whether Q is even or odd. If Q is odd, then you do this computation and it looks like a Rademacher. But for odd Q, uh, the optimum should be order one. We don't know how to prove that. Um, as Q gets larger and larger, it stays looking like a Gaussian. Let's say stick to even Q for a second. As Q gets larger and larger, it stays looking like a Gaussian until Q is proportional to square root N. Um, for birthday paradox reasons, that's the point at which two random monomials have a constant chance of having some overlap. And then uh, the answer starts to change. And you get an explicit distribution of compact support uh, called the Q Hermit polynomial. That Q is not the same as this Q. It's the Q of like combinatorialist, like deformed Q models of things. Um, but it's some explicit thing, actually with compact support. So it's optimum should be order one. And then as Q tends towards N, it tends towards the semicircle law. So the physicists are also quite excited that like there's a phase transition at like square root n for like what SYK looks like. Whereas we're quite used unused to like studying you know random degree root n polynomials. Yeah. Are, are these two things you just mentioned related to uh, like Keston McKay or some just some other random sequence that tends to uh, yeah, uh, they have been studied, for example, by like free probabilists, like Roland Spiker has a paper where he's studying these distributions. It's like a one family parameter of probability distributions. You can write down the PDF, it's like sort of annoying, but it has a property if you vary the parameter to one limit, it becomes a semicircle law. If you vary the parameter to the other limit, it becomes a Gaussian. And like outside these two limits, it's some you know strange function of compact support. And there's like some like alternate odd version of that with like the same properties, but like instead of going to Gaussian, it goes to Rademacher. So does the parity matter when Q is larger than root n? Yeah, the parity always matters, I'm pretty sure. The Rademacher thing is for all Q is like larger. Yeah, I think it's like Q goes to like from constant up to n through the odds. If I remember it correctly, like it stays like a Rademacher until root n. Oh, and then I, yeah, maybe not. I think then it changes to this explicit distribution and then it changes to semicircle. I have to check actually, I can't remember. Okay, thank you very much. So let's pick a